Hello, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjam Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the recent use of genome sequencing to map the ancient indigenous populations of Uruguay who were driven to extinction by the conquistadors of the 1500s. This research demonstrates a fascinating interdisciplinary relationship between genetics and anthropology to further the goals of each field. With me today, I have Dr. John Lindo, an assistant professor of anthropology at Emory University. Dr. Lindo is an expert in the use of ancient DNA research to study populations and cultures across history. Welcome, Dr. Lindo. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So before we begin, I think it's important for the audience to get to know the basics of your research. So how has genetics played a role in the world of anthropology, and how have the two fields collaborated historically leading until today? Uh, so that's that's a really good question because um, genetics has sort of been around with anthropology for a long time in a different form. So um, I would say before 2010, before the era of genomics, where we're able to sequence whole genomes even on the ancient level in a day, um, before that, I think maybe for like a good 30 years, mitochondrial DNA was being used in anthropology, and it was being used, as, and, to, and to a lesser extent, the Y chromosome to detect uh, human migrations through time. And so genetics has always sort of been a, more of, for that chunk of time, it's, it's been around. But I think um, things radically changed in 2010 with the advent of next generation sequencing, because... Um, we were no longer sort of limited to these migration stories with just mitochondria and looking at uh, paternal lineages, but we could actually ask really cool questions um, like things like how do the, does the Neanderthal genome relate to humans and things like what my lab does, which is detect natural selection and adaptation to ancient events in humans utilizing ancient DNA and genomic. So that's how um, right now the landscape is very different than uh the possibilities are really sort of just starting to become realized for joining genomics and anthropology. I see. So getting into more detail about your lab, what kind of uses have you found for genetics and anthropology before the project that you've undertaken for this study? Um, so I, I started with um, trying to understand Native Americans in terms, or, or rather the indigenous people from the Americas in terms of the diseases that they may have adapted to before European contact, uh, mainly because I was um, not really satisfied with some of the narratives out there that um, indigenous people were uh, had low genetic diversity or that they were uh, particularly vulnerable to diseases when Europeans came and brought those diseases. I really wanted to set out to actually sort of disclaim a lot of that by actually saying that there were certain, of course, there were diseases when the first migrants, say 30,000 or 25,000 years ago, entered into the Americas and they adapted. And some of my first work shows that um, indigenous people from uh, British Columbia adapted to disease before the arrival of Europeans because they had to. They, of course, one of the new things that they were going to encounter were new ecologies. And within those ecologies, there are going to be pathogens that people needed to adapt to in order to survive and to successfully establish. So that's how I started my career. Um, but I think also my focus has shifted more into uh, detecting sort of adaptation to a sort of severe uh, environments like high altitude. I'm extremely interested in those types of questions, especially um, how people first adapted to the Andes thousands of years ago to actually be so successful and then lead to those incredible empires that we saw right about um, for thousands of years. Interesting. And your work specifically with this study is dealing with indigenous populations in Uruguay, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So could you give a brief explanation of their history with the information that you had before discovering what you now know from this research? Right. So that this is one of uh, really one of the probably one of the more tragic stories. I think European contact and the arrival of Europeans in the 500 years ago had devastating consequences uh, through pathogens, through slavery, warfare, 
cultural alterations. I mean, there's an array of, of reasons why they cause the decline of indigenous people throughout the Americas. But in certain countries or the states that we see today, Uruguay is sort of an exception because it doesn't have, quote unquote, um, indigenous people. Um, although that, that needs to be qualified because I think you're, we're, we'll get into that later in terms of what that actually means. But um, the Spanish, when they arrived, just like with any other area, they were in conflict with indigenous people. But in that particular area, after the state of Uruguay was formed, um, or and before it, the Spanish were really um, having all of these military campaigns to actually eradicate the indigenous people in from what is today Uruguay. Um, and they successfully did that. And in fact, there's some horrible stories in the 1800s of the last indigenous families that were uh, spared because they were taken to places like France to be living um, museum exhibits. And that's some of the last um, really sort of documentation of the indigenous people as they were before the arrival of Europeans. So it's sort of a, a really tragic story in terms of a really sort of an extermination of, of just not one indigenous group, but uh, many indigenous groups that were in what is today Uruguay. Wow. So what were some of the main groups of indigenous populations that you studied in Uruguay? So that's a, that's a good question because, uh, so we only did one particular archeological site um, in Uruguay, and that's where the, the individuals, the ancient individuals before contact come from. Uh, but it's unclear as to whether or not they could be attributed to any of the historical um, tribes that were described by the Spanish and then later on. Um, so this is only one indigenous group that we actually get, um, we got genomes from, but um, it's, it's sort of just connected to that prehistoric uh, indigenous site and not in particular relation to say any of the groups that, that are, uh, that were exterminated or, or had an actual name given to them by, by the Spanish. I see. That makes sense. And so, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So your paper highlights the Charua population. So is that the main indigenous population that was studied in the lab or? Right. So no, it wasn't. Um, so that the reason that that was brought up was because that was one of the last, the last remaining indigenous groups were um, sort of actually came together in a last, last effort to, um, to essentially survive and resist um, all of these military campaigns to essentially exterminate them. And uh, all these groups coming together really sort of just encapsulated that, that term. It wasn't that it was just one indigenous uh, group, but it was just a variety of indigenous groups. And that's now, I think, become sort of synonymous for indigenous ancestry now in Uruguay. Um, but there were many different groups, not just uh, that one. And that one, though, I think was one of the largest, though. And I think that's probably why, but I could be mistaken, why they were able to polarize the various indigenous communities that were left before um, the, those military campaigns took full effect. I understand. So, what specifically inspired you to utilize your lab to study this population and Uruguayan pre-Columbian history? Is this unique to Uruguay that they completely decimated every indigenous population or is there something else? Uh, right. So that's well, um, the reason that I was able to work with Uruguay samples is because I was in, in collaboration with two colleagues at a university down in Uruguay um, who um, I'm, in terms of actually extracting the genome, uh, they were sent to my lab because of previous collaborations with mitochondrial DNA and ancient samples from the same archaeological site. Um, but that was the only way that I was able to actually work with those samples. It was in, in direct collaboration with my colleagues in Europe. I see. So getting more into the science-based aspect of your research, how exactly were you able to merge genetics and anthropology for your study? For example, how did you go about using this genome sequencing with the other lab in Uruguay to determine the locations of pre-Columbian indigenous populations? Um, well, it wasn't, I want to say that it was 
determine the location because I think the archaeology does that in terms of where the indigenous people were coming from and where the genomes. I think what we did in, in my lab by exploring the genome is that we were able to give light that this is actually, these people are actually part of an ancestry from South America that hasn't been detected before. And, and I don't think that should be too much of a surprise because of, well, they were uh, the collapse. There was population collapse all over South America. And obviously in Uruguay, it was almost um, near total collapse. So the fact that we sequenced these genomes from the indigenous people that we don't really know much about, if anything, from a genetic or evolutionary perspective, it shouldn't, it's, it, of course, they're going to be their own ancestry, right? This isn't, South America wasn't just this one Native American lineage. It's, it's, it was comprised of many different lineages and many different populations. So we're just really sort of a, starting to really unravel some of the gene genetic diversity that existed in South America before Europe, Europeans arrived. And I think this Uruguay uh, individual start to sort of exemplify that. So what are the main, like, what are the main um, pieces of information that can be garnered from genetic, genetic sequencing in the context of this study? So one of the things that's really interesting um, is that there is a movement right now in Uruguay to reclaim indigenous ancestry. So at, as I said before, there was these military campaigns um, that tried to exterminate all the indigenous people. But there was gene flow between the Europeans that were there and then eventually became citizens of Uruguay and then their descendants but between them and the indigenous people. So there are people in Uruguay that have been that have oral histories, essentially, that they have indigenous ancestry. Um, but this is this study and these genomes that can actually now be used to see if there's some sort of relation to that, that particular indigenous group and the genomes of the people actually living in Uruguay. So now it's giving a potential tie to that lost indigenous ancestry that they're, that they're um, hopefully going to reclaim. Certainly they can reclaim it in many different ways, including identity, but this is just one other way that biology and the genome can be used to reclaim that ancestry. I see. So when you're excavating an archeological sample of an individual that you're trying to study how are you able to determine genetically that they were a member of an indigenous tribe or not? Right. So, yeah, so that's a complicated question. And I think um, since this is only one particular site um, right now, it's, it's sort of going to be, uh, you can look at long stretches of DNA between say the modern individuals and look at the long stretches in the ancient individuals. And you can see if there's some sort of similarity or matches between the two. And in that way, you can actually detect whether or not there's some affinity between the two populations. Now, I will say that it's, it's going to be a really limited data set because there's only one particular site that we have genomes for. So it's going to be difficult as to whether or not we'll be able to match them. I think it's more, uh, I think also a future endeavor to sequence more sites pre-contact and then have an array sort of a, of indigenous, ancient indigenous people that you can draw from in order to see these matches with the modern Uruguayan people, if that makes sense. <laughs> Definitely. So are there other labs that you're collaborating with to try and achieve that goal? Or is that something that you're trying to do uh, in the future after this study is now published? Yeah, so I do collaborate with other um, universities or researchers at universities throughout South America and Mesoamerica. And the one of the overarching goals of my lab is to really start creating sort of a, a really comprehensive like genomic studies that cover many countries and many different regions. And then hopefully so one of the outcomes of that is, of course, you're, the, besides the science, I think there's sort of an anthropological and sort of a human thing where uh, people even in the United States who identify as Latinx could potentially use this data to explore their, in, their own indigenous ancestry um, in terms of what ancient civilization they might actually, that indigenous ancestry might stem from. So that's one of the bigger goals. And that's obviously going to be, you know, five or 10 years out before we can do something like that because um, these projects take a, 
take a long time and it's hard to actually get um, a sample that even has viable DNA. So it's sort of like a, a crapshoot as to whether or not you can even sequence them to do a meaningful study. Absolutely. So your paper also mentions the use of haplogroups, mitochondrial DNA, and more to study sequence samples. So were there any significance to the specific genes and alleles you chose to record and look for? Uh, so in, in terms of, um, I think it was more that we're not, uh, we didn't do like a selection scan or anything like that, mainly because there were only two samples that we were able to get genomes from. So in this particular case, uh, it was more just the, the haplotypes of, of the entirety of the genome that were used in general, sort of, sort of averaged out. Um, that showed that ancestry in general that was different than anything that's been seen in South America before, ancient or living. And then the mitochondrial haplogroup, which is inherited from your mother, so it's giving you some information about the uh, maternal lineage, that also was shown to be rare and not previously discovered. So again, some more proof um, that this indigenous ancestry is unique to Uruguay or unique to the region, but also given this um, idea that Really, South America was a genetically diverse um, you know, set of very different populations that existed before European contact. I see. And so you mentioned that there's one site that you used for archaeological research over the course of this study. So how did you choose this area and how did you know that it would be important for excavation? Oh, so that's how I, so the, my colleagues in Uruguay are the, are the archaeologists. So they, they are the ones, this is their site and they were the ones who did the, the, uh, excavate. So that's, that's how I usually collaborate our researchers who are archaeologists who then have some, you know, meaningful context about, um, these individuals and I get to, uh, work with them, but from a genetic perspective. So I, I can't claim that I did the archaeology. <laughs> I see. So was this site, um, was it like a town where they um, lived or how, what was the site when it was in use? Right. So this was a, a village um, that was about, uh, I think, uh, I think it was unoccupied, but I could be wrong. Now I'm scratching my head about it, but I think it was in continuous um, occupation for about 1500 years, roughly. And yes, it was a, it was a village. Um, so uh, whether or not it was occupied by the same group, it's difficult to say, um, but the archeology span seems to say that it is in terms of material culture. Um, but seeing how it spans over a thousand years, it'd be interesting to have more individuals for, um, from different time points to see whether or not the, the people change in terms of occupying that area. Right. And just the fact alone that a single village could stand for 1500 years and constantly be inhabited is fascinating. Yeah. Right. And this is all yet before European contact, but and unfortunately all essentially um, to a certain extent was, was a race. Right. And now it's coming back in terms of interest in terms of, trying to understand indigenous cultures and indigenous ancestry uh, before the arrival of Europeans, which I think is, is fantastic because that's one of the, one of the goals of my lab is to actually help people, like I said before, in the United States, uh, like, my, like myself, who are Latinx, to understand their indigenous ancestry. So I'm glad that it's also uh, proactively happening elsewhere and that I can actually participate in that. Definitely. And last question about the site. So was it also destroyed by the conquistadors in the 1800s? Uh, yeah. No, so it wasn't. So that one, I think it's, and I, I, could, I had to fact check myself, but I believe that it was um, abandoned uh, before the uh, Spanish arrived. But I could be wrong, but I think that's true. I don't think they actually had some open conflict with that particular side had an open conflict with the Spanish. But I need so to So the reason that, myself. yeah. So then the reason that this site was so significant for the study is because it was like sort of a window into life before European contact. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So that was a really important um, that we were able to, to capture that before any influence from Europeans. 
Right. And so also in your study, and you've mentioned this a little bit before, you referenced how gene flow was present across the individuals you studied. So how were you able to detect this phenomena of gene flow across different areas of Uruguay and in the Arcoli? archaeological site. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So that's another interesting aspect and unsuspect and like a, uh, an unsuspected aspect of the paper was that we found, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's gene flow, but, uh, a tight genetic connection with, um, indiv ancient individuals pre-contact from Panama. Right. And that's, that's really interesting because those two populations are thousands of miles away. And obviously there wasn't any type of technology like we have today in terms of, <laughs> of um for mobility and things like that so that was unexpected but it could be that what we're actually detecting is a common migration route that made it the same uh, it's possible that a migration route that led to the indigenous people uh, from a particular study that we use from panama may have been tightly connected to the migration that left led to the uruguay indigenous people that we studied so that's a really sort of not it was unexpected and um uh, an interesting aspect of the paper to find such a connection between super distant people. That's fascinating. So is that the main theory as to why they're so interconnected th between Panama and Uruguay? Right. Yeah. So that's another thing that's sort of a, a, one of the big questions for archaeology and genetics. And so certainly the union between the two is really trying to understand the various migrations that occurred into the Americas, especially the first ones. And of course, what we're focusing on here is uh, migrations into Mesoamerica and South America. I think there's some theories that it was just this singular event, but there's also theories that are multiple events at different times led to different populations. And that's what I think it seems to be happening now, which also makes sense. It's, it's not one, one popul not one migration that led to everybody in South America, but it looks like it was more nuanced than that. Right. So does gene flow's existence in a sample such as what you noticed make it more difficult to differentiate between specific indigenous populations? Uh, no, uh, no, there's, there's definitely different uh, analyses that you can do to look at different ancestries and also connection between the populations. So it just depends on which, um, which technique you're using in order to ask a particular question, say gene flow con or continuity or distinction or things like that. I see. And so I had asked you before um, when we were beginning the podcast about the history of these populations from the knowledge you had before your study was completed. So now that you've published your findings, what were some of the new findings about these indigenous populations that your group was able to ascertain? Yeah, I think the, I think the big one is definitely um, the migration story and the connection between two distantly, geographically distant populations. I think that was a, that was a, a nice piece, but it also, I think this is just a start. I think this particular paper should really open up um, of course, South America, but Uruguay in general, especially since there's our movement to reclaim indigenous ancestry, I think a, a variety of sites throughout Uruguay through different time points as well should start to be looked at in terms of genomics and starting putting all the pieces together in terms of understanding the evolutionary history of the indigenous people before the arrival of Europeans or the Spanish in this case. I see. And then touching on my previous question really quickly. You mentioned specific techniques like continuity that you that have been used to make these kind of studies. So what were the main techniques that your research used? Uh, in this particular paper, while well, we do some of the like the tried and true population genetic analyses, like cluster analysis to look at ancestry components or different ancestries that might comprise a particular population and very simple things like PCA to look at genetic affinities between populations, both living and ancient in North and South America. Um, then we use a little bit more complex things like F statistics to look at whether or not we see these gene flow events or tight connections between populations that are actually geographically distant and things like that. So that's how we put these, all of these things together to give us not only some, um, some clarity in terms of the evolutionary history, but we can then start creating hypotheses as to why we think we see these types of connections or distinctions between the different analyses. And um, in this particular case, the indigenous people of 
Uruguay. Interesting. So are these techniques like manual procedures that you do, or are they like um, programs that have like machine learning or something like that? Yeah, they're all computational. Um, and in this particular case, we haven't, we didn't do any uh, machine learning or anything like that. They're just um, either model based or summary statistics. I see. So now talking about a little bit of an overall scope of your project, how significant do you believe these discoveries are that you've made to the overall historical field of pre-Columbian history? So for example, will you collaborate with historians and others in the future to add to the history of these populations? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I don't, I'm not sure if, um, if historians, if, if a historian's ever contacted me to do that, but I would love to, but I think the, the, uh, usually, uh, working, continuing to work with my archeology span colleagues in Uruguay would be great to continue and perhaps even working with other archeologists in Uruguay with different sites to start putting this all together in terms of uh, evolutionary history that goes back thousands of years would be, um, fantastic. But yeah, I, the more multidisciplinary my work can be, the better, because if it takes different angles, especially with these ancient prehistory individuals, I think it makes, it really sort of makes a much better sto story and study um, in terms of what we can gain instead of just looking at genetics from indigenous people in, in a vacuum. Absolutely. So now that this specific study has been published for a few months now, do you have any plans to pursue any next goals with your lab with the knowledge that you now have from this study? Yeah, I think the next step is so the there are genomes from Uruguay that were published, I think, last year um, that show potentially that there's some um, admixture between Europeans or individuals that have admixture of European ancestry and indigenous ancestry. So one of the things that we're looking at is to see how they tie in with the ancient individuals that we um, did in that particular study. Right. And so you mentioned or um, you've discussed how important it is to do this kind of genetic studying for specifically Native American populations and Latinx populations that have been so decimated by European contact. So in the future, hypothetically, are there any other areas of history or specific populations that you think you would possibly want to explore using genetics? Um. Well, right now, I think, uh, especially Meso in South America, I think that's going to be keeping me sort of busy for a long time, mainly because <laughs> it's such a huge space and it, and it goes back, you know, 20,000 years plus. And right now we only have a really just a handful of genomes, uh, whole genomes from South America and Mesoamerica. So I think there's just a tremendous amount of work to be done, uh, especially when you contrast Europe that has so much information, both modern and ancient. I think South America is one of those places in, that really needs to be looked at in greater detail. And that's just really going to be my focus because there's so much that, that can be done and so many questions left unanswered in terms of understanding uh, just all the various dimensions of the indigenous people of the Americas from an evolutionary perspective. Absolutely. And you had also expressed interest in using your findings to help Latinx people connect back with their um, indigenous communities. So would you, where would you publish this research or like give the findings of the study to help people achieve that goal? Right. So that's um, one of the things that was, once the, the database gets large enough in terms of having different civilizations or genomes from different civilizations throughout South America and Mesoamerica, my hope is to create a server um, that could potentially, if you have 23andMe results that shows indigenous ancestry from the Americas, we might be able to have you put the, your information into the server and we might be able to run all of the population genetic analyses to see if you have some sort of affinity to any of the civilizations that we have genomes for. And that could be one step, at least biologically, to start reconnecting people in the United States to their indigenous Latinx or their indigenous uh, ancestry from the Americas. But that's, that's still far away because we, we're probably like at 1% of, of where we should be in terms of genomes, something like that, in terms of uh, genomes.
what is this database that you're using? Is this um, publicly available or how does that work? Oh, well, so these are genomes that my lab have published or other labs have published. And so they're usually after, unless they're protected, um, usually they're freely available in something like the European nucleotide archive where the genomes actually get uploaded and you can download them for future analyses or future studies. I see. And then additionally, um, since you mentioned using 23andMe, so would you, would companies like that be using this database that you and your lab created, the 1% that you have already? And also, how long do you estimate it would take to completely finish the database for Mesoamerica and South America? Um, yeah, I mean, I... Uh... They potentially, 23 and me could certainly do that because they could get um, genomes, but I'm not sure how that would work because given that they use like large reference um, panels to, for each population. Mm. So like right now, it's like say for one site, we'll only have one genome. So it's not a very good reference uh, population. Um, and also I'm not sure 20, well, I guess they could, but 23 and me would also sort of be missing the archaeology and the history and all of that things that go back together instead of just, you know, doing what 23andMe does. <laughs> uh, but in terms of getting this to a point where I could do it, yeah, it's probably like a decade out before we can have start having some meaningful results or enough like archaeological sites of civ ancient civilizations to do something um, that would, you know, hopefully have some hits for, for people curious about their ancestry. Definitely. About their ancestry. Sorry, were you saying something? Oh, about their ancient ancestry. Right, because oh. right, because you can do twenty three and Me now, and they'll give you some like uh, information, but especially not with the Americas. Uh, it's it's sparse what they have, mainly because there aren't reference genomes for say, especially from North America, because those are all protected uh, for for a variety of reasons. So it's uh, the Americas is really tricky for twenty three and Me. Right, and so your discoveries throughout this research must have a lot of implications for further study, as we've discussed a little bit earlier, especially as geneticists and anthropologists collaborate to uncover more ancient history that was previously impossible to uncover without new technology. So I would like to talk about your discovery in the context of not only your lab, but also to the global research community. As you mentioned, you were working with Uruguayan labs as well. So as a conclusion to the interview, how would you recommend that other scientists and researchers around the world build on your research to use genetic sequencing in anthropological efforts across history? Oh, I think there's, um, well, there's other labs that there's only, a, well, there's a handful of labs, uh, mainly in Europe. And also there's a couple or a handful in the United States as well that, that have been doing, doing that. Um, but I think now it's gotten really tricky because um, there's uh, ethics that need to be put in and some labs <laughs> have, don't necessarily follow the right ethics uh, in terms of making sure that they understand um, whose ancestry they're actually reporting to and who are the stakeholders that should be aware of this type of research. So that's made things very complicated and I think complicated in a good way that this discourse is starting in terms of how to actually do ancient DNA when it relates to humans and these ancient ancestries, um, to try to identify who, you know, who are the, the people who should be most involved in this type of research because they're directly related to it. Um, so I think that's, that's the discourse now, um, because if it's been happening for the past decade, but now I think we're heading towards a more responsible way to do this type of work, which is great. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Lindo, thank you so much for appearing on this podcast. It's really been so fun and interesting talking to you about your research. And good luck with completing the rest of the database and your future work with genetics and anthropology. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation. And it was wonderful to, to be interviewed by you. This was fantastic. I really appreciate it.